as believers living in a fallen, sinful world, as people who find ourselves, even as forgiven sinners, still waging war with our own sin, still being surrounded by the sin of others and the sin that's so prevalent in our culture, we're deeply aware of this fact. The world is a broken place and everyone and everything in it needs to be rescued. The world is a broken place and everyone and everything in it needs to be rescued from both physical and spiritual corruption. The world needs redeemed. It's messed up. And as we reflect upon that reality, understanding the brokenness and the sinfulness of the world in which we live, one of the stumbling blocks that might arise in your mind and mine deals with this question. How can the Lord, how can God accomplish his purposes in this messed up broken place that's filled with messed up broken people? How, how can he do it? How can he pull it off? You'd think we, being who we are, would cause things to go askew. I mean, think about it. How can the Lord carry out his plans through people when the only kind of people he has to work with are corrupted by sin? One thing we've definitely learned in Genesis thus far is that the people through whom God is working are far from perfect. They're sinners in need of grace and redemption. Like all of us, they stumble and sin sometimes in egregious ways. And when we see this, we ask ourselves, doesn't the sin that's present in the world and the sin that remains present among his redeemed deter the Lord from accomplishing his will? Does the presence of sin frustrate the plans of God? This familiar narrative of Genesis 27 concerning the blessing of Jacob will help us with our struggles with these kinds of questions. So again, Genesis 27, the narrative begins in verses 1 through 4, and in this first section of Genesis 27, we learn about Isaac's deal. Isaac's deal. Moses writes in verses 1 through 4, When Isaac was old, and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And Esau answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. We learn much from the opening section of this chapter. It lays the groundwork for everything else that we see take place in the narrative. The description of Isaac in verse 1 is crucial, a very crucial piece of information because it's Isaac's decrepit condition that makes the deception we're going to see later in the chapter actually possible. In addition to learning about Isaac's elderly condition, we also learn of his intention to bless Esau and thus make him the heir of the covenant promises he received from the Lord. Isaac summoned his firstborn son Esau and he struck a deal with him. He requested that Esau go out on a hunt and bring him some of the, the delicious food that he loves. And in return, Esau would receive his blessing. This scenario does not come as a surprise to us because we've already learned about Isaac and Esau's relationship back in Genesis 25. It is there we learn that Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, and that Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. Esau's skill set and Isaac's love for his son's food sets the stage for the drama that's going to unfold in the chapter. Now, before we move on to see what happens next, we must realize that this deal of Isaac's and his intention to bless Esau as the heir of the covenant promises is problematic for at least three reasons. First of all, in Genesis chapter 23, we learned about what the Lord declared would come to pass. While Jacob and Esau struggled together in Rebekah's womb, it distressed her greatly and it compelled her to inquire of the Lord. It was a foreshadowing of the great struggle that would come between these two brothers. 
In response to her inquiry, Rebecca received an oracle from the Lord in which he clearly revealed the older will serve the younger. God chose Jacob over Esau while they were in Rebekah's womb, before they were born, or had done anything either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, Romans chapter 9. It was revealed to Rebekah that the younger son, Jacob, not Esau, would be the one through whom the covenant promises and redemptive plan of the Lord would be carried out. And yet, here we find Isaac making plans to bless his firstborn, Esau, not Jacob, as God's chosen heir. Secondly, we learned in Genesis 25 that Esau, Isaac's firstborn, sold his birthright to his brother. Even though the way in which Jacob obtained the birthright from Esau is not exactly an example of integrity, Jacob legally secured for himself the status of firstborn in Isaac's family, along with all the rights and privileges that came with it, including receiving the blessing from Isaac and being labeled as the heir of the covenant promises. Thirdly, in the concluding verses of Genesis 26, verses considered by many Bible teachers to be the formal introduction to this narrative in Genesis 27, we learn that Esau married two Canaanite women, an action that falls completely outside the pattern we've seen thus far with Abraham and Isaac. Esau married women who worshipped idols, the false gods of the land of Canaan. The fundamental reason God would later prohibit intermarriage with the Canaanites in the law of Moses. And as the conclusion of Genesis 26 reveals, Esau's marriage to these Canaanite women made life bitter, the text says, for Isaac and Rebekah. So even though God elected Jacob and Esau despised his birthright, something the New Testament writer of Hebrews says, Esau profaned his birthright. He treated it as an unholy thing, as though it were nothing. Just traded it off for a bowl of red stew. And even though he married two unbelieving Canaanite women who worshipped idols instead of the one true and living God, Isaac struck a deal with his firstborn son that clearly reveals his intention to bless Esau and make him the heir of the covenant promises is an act that is contrary to the will of God as it has been revealed thus far in the book of Genesis. Now, having seen Isaac's deal, let's move on to the next section of the chapter in which we learn about Rebekah's design. Rebekah's design. The section begins in verses 5 through 10 where Moses writes this. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went out to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two young good goats so that I may prepare from them delicious food for your father such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. The motivation behind Rebecca's design for deception is not revealed explicitly in the text. We simply learn that she desires for Isaac to bless Jacob instead of Esau. We do know from Genesis 25 that she loved Jacob. Remember it said Isaac loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And we know the Lord revealed to her that the older son Esau would serve the younger. That also, the nation formed from Jacob's descendants would be stronger than the nation formed from Esau's descendants. That's what we know. So we come to the text with that bit of knowledge and we're left to kind of wonder to ourselves what's driving this design of deception. Perhaps Rebecca was attempting to bring to pass what the Lord revealed to her in the oracle. The Lord said the older will serve the younger, but she sees Isaac going to bless Esau but she's not, certainly not waiting on the Lord to bring that about. It's similar to what we saw back in Genesis 16 with Abram and Sarai. You probably recall that. God promised Abraham a son, and yet all these years go by, still no son. So instead of waiting on the Lord to fulfill the promise, they said, I'm going to take this into my own hands, and they get a surrogate. 
Sarai comes up with this plan to have Abraham marry Hagar, her female Egyptian servant, and they try to have a child that way. Maybe this is a similar scenario. Or perhaps she's acting purely on the basis of impartiality and trying to excuse me, secure the blessing for the son she loves. Maybe it's as simple as that. Can't be totally certain concerning her motivation. But regardless of her motive, her plan is incredibly dishonest and deceitful. That much is clear. We don't have to know her motive to know that. She's being deceitful and dishonest. Having heard Rebekah's plan to secure the blessing and being called to obey his mother's voice, Jacob begins thinking through these things. Starts mulling over his mom's design. Moses writes in verses 11 and 12, But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself, and not a blessing. Back at the scene of their birth, we learn that Esau came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. Of course, this fact about Esau is throwing a wrench into the gears of Rebekah's plan, because Jacob's a smooth man, he says, not a hairy man like his brother. It seems that Jacob knew his blind, elderly father would touch him as he interacted with him. And if he did, that plan is totally blown. Isaac would uncover Rebekah and Jacob's scheme to obtain his blessing. While there is clearly the desire to obey his mother who loves him, as well as the desire to inherit the blessing from his father, we, we know that from him buying the birthright from Jacob. He also doesn't want to mock his father or be cursed by him instead of blessed. So he's kind of stuck in this weird situation. So how would Rebecca respond to Jacob's feedback and his concern regarding the plan? It's pretty legitimate feedback. Verse 13, Moses writes, His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me. My son, only obey my voice and go bring them to me. Rebecca insists on Jacob's obedience to her deceitful design. She insists that her, her son obey her by disobeying the Lord and deceiving his own father. It is, frankly, staggering to me to discover that Rebekah's desire to see Isaac bless Jacob instead of Esau is so great, she is willing to take his curse upon herself if he's caught by his father. Well, the design has been drawn up by Rebekah. Now preparations must be made if the deceitful design is to be executed. And that's what we see in verses 14 through 17 where Moses writes this. So Jacob went and took two good young goats and brought them to his mother. And his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goat she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son, Jacob. <clears throat> She's clearly determined to see Isaac bless Jacob instead of Esau, her firstborn. She goes to great lengths here to make sure this deceitful design is executed perfectly. She even utilizes the fur from the slain animals to deceive Isaac into thinking smooth Jacob is none other than hairy Esau, which may seem kind of silly until you remember that Isaac is literally a decrepit old blind man. Though he lived for quite a while after this event, it seems that both Isaac and Rebekah think that his death could take place at any time. That's why he calls Esau to go out and get the game so that he can bless him. He, he's going to bless him because he knows his time is short. He's an old dying man. And therefore, Rebekah's design just might work to secure Isaac's blessing for her dearly loved youngest son. So, we've learned of Isaac's deal. We've been informed about Rebekah's design. Now we're going to read of Jacob's deceitfulness. Jacob's first lie of many 
is revealed in verses 18 and 19. There Moses writes, So Jacob went into his father and said, My father. And Isaac said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat my game that your soul may bless me. First lie is that Jacob claims to be his older brother Esau. And notice he doesn't merely identify himself as Esau. He's quick to say, I'm Esau, your firstborn. The firstborn evidently is the one in Isaac's mind who should receive the blessing and be identified as the heir of the covenant promises. We talked about that in the past. And Jacob knows that. So first he claims to be Esau and he quickly calls for his father, get up old man, eat this so you can get on with the business of blessing me. Moving on to verse 20, we read Isaac's response to his youngest son, son's first lie, which of course prompts a second lie to be told. It's like digging a hole that never really gets dug. It just keeps going down further and further. In the first half of verse 20, we read, But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you found it so quickly, my son? Isaac, though an old dying man, seems to know that the turnaround time's not matching up here. It's just too fast. How could Esau have gone out in the field, hunted game, killed it, and re prepared a meal for him that quickly? There was really only one possible explanation, if it would have been true, Jacob responds to his father's query in the second half of verse 20. There Moses writes, he answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. In a blasphemous moment, Jacob att attributes his success to the Lord himself. He brings their God into this web of deception in order to cover his own tracks. Well, having walked with the Lord this long, Isaac knows it certainly was not outside the realm of possibility for the Lord to grant this kind of success to someone. You remember Genesis 26 and how the Lord worked to secure Isaac a wife. God answered the prayer of Abraham's servant before the words were even out of his mouth, the text says. So God can do this. However, these first two lies of Jacob have not yet convinced his father. Moses writes in verse 21, Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. Isaac's not yet convinced and therefore he summons his son to come closer so that he can feel him. Why? We already know why from the text. Because he wanted to conclusively validate whether or not this is really his firstborn. Jacob was right to question his mother's deceitful design. He knew that his blind, elderly, decrepit father would do this. Now is the moment when we see whether or not Rebecca's usage of the goat skins would be successful in deceiving her husband. Moses writes in verses 22 through 23, So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him, because his hands were hairy like his brother's Esau's hands. So he blessed him. The goat skins seem to have clinched the blessing for Jacob. This final trick, the very thing Jacob was worried about when his mother revealed her dishonest design, worked. Moses wrote at the end of verse 23, so he blessed him. The narrator is clearly communicating the plan was successful. But instead of just ending the scene there, we learn a little bit more about what unfolded between Isaac and Jacob. Verse 24, we read of Jacob's final lie to his father. There Moses writes, Isaac said, Are you really my son Esau? Jacob answered, I am. Even though the goat skin seems to have convinced Isaac that Jacob is Esau, he remains hesitant and asks one last time, Is it really you? And after Jacob's final deceptive statement in the narrative, assuring his father, It's Esau, it's your firstborn we see Isaac proceed to actually pronounce his blessing upon Jacob in the climax of the narrative in verses 25 through 29. A blessing that will prove to be prophetic as it reveals the future for God's covenant people. Moses writes in verses 25 through 29, Then Isaac said, Bring the food near to me, that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. 
So he brought it near to him, and he ate. And he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him, and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments. Remember, they're Esau's garments. They were in the house. And Isaac blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. All of the deceitfulness from Rebecca and Jacob, all of it was working toward the attainment of this blessing from Isaac. Just as God had blessed both Abraham and Isaac by abundantly providing for them, he said that he would bless them and make their names great. Now Isaac is calling for the Lord of heaven to abundantly provide for his son by giving him the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. But in verse 29, the blessing goes beyond seeking the Lord's provision for his son. We see how the blessing aligns with the covenant commitments that have been revealed over and over again to Abraham and Isaac. Moreover, the blessing of Isaac unknowingly calls for the fulfillment of the oracle the Lord gave to Rebekah while Esau and Jacob were still in the womb. Not only does Isaac prophetically reveal that the brothers or family members of Jacob will bow down before him, just as the Lord said, but Isaac calls for something that was revealed to Abraham and Sarah way back in Genesis 17. The Lord told them that kings would come from them. And as salvation history continues, we discover that a descendant from God's covenant people will be a king who reigns in righteousness over all the nations of the earth. And according to the blessing that Isaac unknowingly bestows upon Jacob, just such a king will descend from him. The peoples, the nations will in some sense bow down to the nation that is formed from Jacob, the nation of Israel. And beyond that, the nations will eventually bow down to a particular descendant who sits on the throne of God's kingdom on earth. And in keeping with God's covenant promises to Abraham, those who bless Jacob and his descendants will experience blessing from God, but those who curse Jacob and his descendants, the curse of God will fall upon them. So, having seen Isaac's deal, Rebekah's design, and Jacob's deceitfulness, we're now entering the final section of the narrative in which we learn of Esau's disappointment. Esau's disappointment. The section begins when Esau returns from the field and comes before his father. Moses writes in verses 30 through 33, As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of his father, Isaac, Esau, his brother, came in from hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, Who are you? He answered, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came, and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. Esau was obedient to his father. He hunted game. He prepared delicious food such as his father loved. He brought it before him and he asked for the blessing. Just as Isaac assured him he would receive. But Esau had absolutely no idea that his father already went through this experience just moments earlier. The narrator of Genesis doesn't excellent job of bringing to the forefront the gut-wrenching emotional response of Isaac when he realizes he's been deceived. After Esau identifies himself, Moses writes that Isaac trembled very violently. He trembled with a great trembling, the Hebrew says. 
The deception he experienced and the realization that he blessed his youngest son instead of Esau was so intense that he was overwhelmed with fear. In addition to a strong emotional response, we also see a verbal response which indicates that the blessing he bestowed upon Jacob is irrevocable. After telling Esau that he already blessed someone who brought him game to eat, Isaac said, yes, and he shall be blessed. We can't know for certain, but it is as though Isaac finally realized the oracle given to Rebekah by the Lord, it was going to come to pass in spite of his intention to bless Esau and make him the heir of the covenant promises. The narrative continues toward its conclusion by transitioning from Isaac's emotional response to that of Esau's. In verses 34 through 38, there Moses writes, As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you. And all his brothers I have given to him for servants. And with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Esau sought his father's blessing with tears, and yet the blessing had already been given to his youngest brother, Jacob. In the words of Isaac, he has taken away Esau's blessing. Esau's disappointment could not be expressed any more clearly. But in spite of his weeping, Isaac once again reiterates the irrevocable nature of the blessing he pronounced upon Jacob. Just as the Lord revealed all those years earlier, the older will serve the younger. The narrative concludes with Isaac's response to Esau's request that he bless him also. However, when Isaac opens his mouth, The only thing that can come out are words that uphold and confirm the blessing that's already been given to Jacob. Moses concludes the narrative in verses 39 through 40, writing this, Then Isaac his father answered Esau and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless you shall break his yoke from your neck. What is pronounced over Esau by Isaac is the exact opposite of the blessing bestowed upon Jacob. Some commentators call it an anti-blessing. It's the mere image of what Jacob receives just moments earlier. There is this faint glimmer of hope which reveals that Esau shall break Jacob's yoke from his neck. That'll happen in Genesis, but the end result will still be the older brother serving the younger brother and the nation descending from the younger brother being stronger than that of the older brother. After making our way through Isaac's deal, Rebekah's design, Jacob's deceitfulness, and Esau's disappointment, we learn the words of the Lord stand firm. The oracle given to Rebekah would certainly come to pass. However, no one would have predicted that this is the way it was going to be fulfilled. No one. As one steps back from this famous narrative in Genesis 27 and reflects upon the message being communicated to the readers of the text, both the original audience, Israel, and us, the contemporary church, God's people today in Christ. We learn this. We learn of the Lord's dominion over deception. In other words, 
we learn that human sinfulness, sin like that of Rebecca and Jacob's deceitful scheming, it does not frustrate the plans of our sovereign God. Not in the least. God's people at times may ask themselves how it is that the Lord can accomplish his plans and purposes in a world filled with sin. But time and time again, the Lord proves he truly is sovereign over all things. That he governs all things, including the wicked actions of men. And he does it all in order to accomplish his will and to redeem, to save his people. The Lord has been working in and through the actions of sinful men ever since Adam's fall in the Garden of Eden. Adam's sin did not catch God off guard. And out of that sin, God brought the greatest good imaginable. He brought the promise of the gospel and the plan to raise up a deliverer from the seed of the woman who would crush Satan's head, that tempter, and reverse the curse of sin. The Lord worked to bring good out of the sins of Cain, Noah, Lot, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He has proven in this very narrative that he is able to continue carrying out his plan of redemption for his covenant people by bringing his purposes to pass even through the most egregious human acts of deception. Even when that deception comes forth from his very own people. We will see the Lord continue doing this kind of thing throughout the book of Genesis. That's what the whole narrative of Joseph from Genesis 37 to Genesis 50 is about. There's one big message there. And it's this, the Lord is sovereign and he will take what man means for evil and use it, mean it, to accomplish their good, to save many alive as it is this day. The whole end of Genesis teaches this very truth. He will accomplish his purposes and bring good out of sin and he did it throughout all of Old Testament history. It is a theme that runs throughout all of redemptive history and on into the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the offspring of Abraham. It is the Lord Jesus and his reign as King of kings and Lord of lords that ultimately fulfills the blessing Jacob obtained from his father by means of deception. If you wonder whether or not the presence of sin in the world can hinder the Lord from accomplishing his plans for redemption and carrying out his purposes, just take a look at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The most heinous, blasphemous, wicked sin that has ever taken place on the planet is the murder of the perfect, holy, righteous beautiful, incarnate Son of God. It is the highest level of wickedness conceivable. And yet, God used the most wicked of all sins to accomplish the salvation of His people and to bring out the greatest good imaginable. The undeserved persecution of Jesus during his earthly ministry. The false accusations of the Jewish leaders of his day. The deception of Judas Iscariot, one of his own personally chosen 12 apostles. The false witnesses at the rigged trials of the Sanhedrin the blasphemy of King Herod as he stands before the Son of God Almighty, the indifference of Pilate washing his hands of the blood of the innocent Lord Jesus as though that absolved him of his guilt before the Lord, 
the bloodthirsty cries of the Jewish crowd. Crucify him. Crucify him. The indescribable violence of Roman soldiers in their mockery of the king of glory as they plucked out his beard and put a crown of thorns on his head and scourged him till he was unrecognizable. All of it leading to the Son of God being nailed to a tree as a criminal. These things add up to become the most vile, wicked actions that the world has ever known. There is nothing more sinful than planning and perpetrating the murder of the Holy Son of God. Nothing. And yet, it neither frustrated nor hindered the plans and purposes of our sovereign God. Not in the least, it fulfilled the plans and purposes of God. After having seen the resurrected Christ with his own eyes and being commissioned by Christ prior to his, to his ascension to preach the gospel to all nations, the Apostle Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost before thousands in Acts chapter 2 and he said these words, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Down to verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Here we learn that the sinful actions of lawless men, men who crucified and killed the Holy One of Israel, took place in accordance with the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. All with the aim of accomplishing the salvation of the world. The Jesus that these Jews sinfully crucified and killed, he was made both Lord and and Christ by his Father. Out of the most sinful actions that have ever taken place in history, God accomplished the greatest good. In the same book of the New Testament, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4, after a time of persecution, the disciples went to the Lord in prayer and they asked the Lord to embolden them so that they would continue to preach about the crucified and risen Messiah even in the face of opposition. And in their prayer, in Acts 4, 27 and 28, we read the following words. For truly in this city, in Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Once again, the sinful words and deeds of Herod, Herod Pilate, the Romans, and the Jews. Sinful words and deeds which ultimately led to the innocent, holy Son of God being tortured and murdered were not only used by God to accomplish His purposes, they were part of the plan. These sinful, deceitful men did whatever the Lord's hand and the Lord's plan had predestined to take place. What does all this mean? That Herod, Pilate, the Romans, and the Jews, that they weren't guilty before the Lord or responsible for their actions? The murder of the Son of God? Absolutely not. Peter said in his sermon, you crucified and killed, you lawless men. They're guilty. They're responsible beings. It was wickedness of the highest degree and the apostles identified it as such. Then what's the point? The point is this. The sinfulness of human beings have never and will never frustrate the plans and purposes of your God. 
We learn it through Jacob's deceitfulness and we learn it through Jesus' death. The plans and purposes of our sovereign God cannot be frustrated by the sinfulness of man. His purposes can never be thwarted. His plans can never fail. Though he is neither the author nor approver of sin, the sovereign Lord will accomplish good, holy, and wise purposes, even the eternal redemption of his people through the sins of his fallen creatures, including the sin of deception. And this is such good news because it means that absolutely nothing, including human sin, is going to stand in the way of God saving his people, of God saving you, if you believe on the Lord Jesus. Moreover, the sovereign Lord is able to bring his good purposes to pass in and through our sin and stumbling. He will truly work all things, including human sin, together for the good of those who love God and have been called according to his unstoppable, invincible purpose. I close by simply reading the words that the Lord revealed to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 46, 8 through 10. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose.